Radio.fm. Coming up next, an Astronomy.fm original program. It's time for York Universe, a co-production of the Observatory of York University, Toronto, and the Voice of Astronomy. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. Hey. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. Hello and welcome to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. I'll be your host this evening. This is Dr. Elena Hyde. And tonight I'm actually joined by a special guest, Dr. Paranda Stajbach, and we'll let her introduce herself a little bit later because I have to tell you that we're broadcasting live from the Ellen I. Carswell Observatory tonight, located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This is Science Night in Canada, where the lineup is all Canadian, starting with ourselves, York Universe, then on to Western Worlds, Quirks and Quirks, and Science for the People. York Universe broadcasts every Monday night, uh, unless it's a holiday, at 9 p.m. local Toronto time, or Tuesday morning at 2 a.m. UT, if you're in another time zone. Our York Universe production works in concert with our online public viewing program. That's right, running right now. If you're listening to this live, you can see it, so see it, <laughs> and hear this. Um, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. local Toronto time. All you have to do to follow along the live show there is go over to our website, our new website or newish website, yorku.ca slash science slash observatory, and follow the links to OPV online public viewing, or just click the YouTube link anywhere on that main page, and it will take you in to our YouTube channel where you'll see the LNI Carswell YouTube page uh, for the observatory and you can join in on OPV. They've got lots of lovely archival images tonight. It is once again too cloudy in Toronto to do live imaging, but we have lots of beautiful pictures for you to see. Our broadcast is powered by and in partnership with astronomy.fm, the voice of astronomy. If you have any questions or comments of our past shows or suggestions for future topics, please send us an email at observe at yorku.ca and you'll also find us following along on our Twitter with our uh, handle for York Universe, that is uh, at York Universe, as well as your, at York Observatory, and on Facebook. Uh, that's right, we're on Facebook and Instagram as well. Instagram at York U Observatory and Facebook at Ellen A. Carswell Obs, just to be a little bit different. All of our programs are free, but if you'd like to make a donation, you can head back up to that same website, yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. We will have observatory members monitoring the chat room over on YouTube if you'd like to join in and chat about the terrible cloudy weather in Toronto. So speaking of terrible cloudy weather what can we do when it's cloudy but hang out and talk about astronomy um so i'd like to go ahead and welcome uh dr perandis tashbach for coming back to the show uh perandis thank you for joining us this evening no problem at all i'm happy to be here back again <laughs> back again and it's always great to have you and i'm gathering it is also pretty cloudy over in your area of toronto it is it is it's been gray and uh you know gloomy all day and now we can't see any stars in the sky so hopefully spring is going to come soon yes it's it's had a few false starts as sort of a little bit of clouds uh parting and then a big bucket of snow dumps on top of us um but never fear <laughs> Eventually, we will get some clear nights, and um, you you hear it, heard it here first. We're getting closer and closer to having that robotic observatory up and running, so we'll be able to maximize the uh, the clear observing uh, chances <laughs> that we can possibly get. Hopefully, <laughs> are there any astronomical objects you're looking particularly forward to uh, to seeing? Uh, not really, but I've been teaching a, a course on cultural astronomy recently, which uh, has been quite a journey for me. I have learned a lot about what people thought about different objects that we see in the sky and how they were interpreted or reared in different cultures. So it has been quite uh, an interesting course to teach for me. Um, and maybe one night we can discuss <laughs> some of the stuff that I've learned while teaching this course oh absolutely that will probably have to be a different show entirely because there is so many 
interesting things we can talk about in that area. And of course, being in Toronto, the indigenous astronomy of this particular area, not just Toronto, but also Ontario, is incredibly strong. And if folks are listening and interested in that, I very much recommend Annette Lee's uh, wonderful star charts on her on her website um, as a nice introduction to some indigenous constellations and a little bit of um, navigation around the sky in a little bit of a different way than you might have seen before. Exactly. Um, I will say that if you are out tonight and it's clear, if you're anywhere in Ontario or indeed the Northern Hemisphere, uh, you will actually still see Venus and Jupiter now moving farther and farther apart in the sky. They're following the sun uh, down in the west. And at, as some of you may remember, it was just a, uh, gosh, a few days ago, I want to say, was it um, the 1st of March? <laughs> um, I have trouble remembering the exact day and time, though. But we had, of course, the conjunction of Venus and Jupiter where they had their their um, their closest approach. And now they are, again, moving apart in the sky. So Venus appears to move uh, higher and Jupiter appears to move lower um, at a given time. So for example, if you go out tonight, um, right now it's 9 p.m. if you're listening to this live and you'll see very, very low uh, in the west, Venus and Jupiter just on the horizon setting as we speak. Um, so those two will get farther and farther apart, but they do connect nicely up to Mars, uh, which is still very, very high in the sky. So Mars is all the way up at um, gosh, uh, almost 65 degrees. Um, uh, that's uh, your altitude above the horizon. So it's a wonderful target to take out your binoculars and have a look at a beautiful red planet if you're, well, if you're not completely clouded out, <laughs> so we say. <laughs> um, so that would be my top recommendation, My, I suppose, right after finding a way to get rid of the, uh, the clouds. Um, so just to get us started off here today, I do want to cover one little news item before we sort of start our special broadcast. And we usually do a This Week in uh, Space and Astronomy History, but instead of that, I'd like to give a little bit of a, um, a recognition and uh, um, a reporting. If you haven't heard uh, a few days ago back on, um, uh, gosh, it was... Um, March, um, March 6th, uh, I'm trying to figure out math, can I do, is it was more than a week or not, but we did lose one of Canada's original six astronauts. Um, Dr. Ken Monet uh, passed away at Sunnybrook Veterans Hospital uh, in Toronto on March 6th of this year, so not too long ago. He was 88, uh, 88 years old, so a fairly fairly old fellow, um, but it's, uh, it's still, you know, worth remembering exactly what he what he contributed not just to Canadian astronomy but astronomy at at large um, so the the um, Canada's natu national I should say national research center council selected Dr. Monet on December 5th in 1983 1983 so a um, little bit of history there and this was to be part of Canada Group 1 and that was along with Roberta Bondar, uh, Mark Garneau, uh, Steve McLean, Robert Thursk and Bjarni Tregerson. The Canadian Space Agency uh, actually became Dr. Monet's boss after it was founded in 1989, so about six years later. So he was um, significant in a lot of ways, but unfortunate in uh, that he was the only one of the original six not to fly in space. Um, despite that, he he did a huge amount of work, uh, as I say, for Canada and the space uh, endeavor. Um, lots and lots of contributions to in particular the NASA's space shuttle uh, program and he launched Canada's sort of initial medical experiments um, and this was when Canada flew uh, when it sort of its its first astronauts on mission with STS-41G 
Um, so you had the Space Shuttle Challenger lifting off on October 5th, uh, 1984. And, you know, he was part of a lot of that um, sort of mission planning. He designed alternate, um, uh, you know, payloads and was involved with the International Microgravity Laboratory mission um, in all the way through to 1992. And he basically did a huge amount of work helping not just, as I say, uh, Canadian astronomy, but astronomy in, in general. So it's a few a few interesting facts if you're, um, I don't know, interested in a little bit of Toronto history. Um, but he actually, um, you know, was at the University of Toronto um, here in here in the in the area, shall I say, <laughs> just a little bit south of our, our observatory. And he was actually a star athlete. Um, so you had to be very, very fit to qualify for astronaut training. And he was actually um, at the 1956 Olympic Games uh, representing Canada. Uh, in the high jump. So, um, you know, despite the fact of not being able to go into space, he was still very good at jumping. So I don't know if this is um, some sort of compensation for not being able to jump extra high in low gravity. Um, but he was also a fighter pilot with the Royal Canadian Air Force and a huge contributor to um, a lot of what we think of now as the modern space age. And of course, with so much space exploration coming back, it's worth remembering some of the folks who have, uh, who have come before. So a little bit of a, a shout out um, and a, I suppose a recognition for um, Dr. Ken Monet, um, who passed away just a few days ago on March 6th. Uh, so that's going to be a little bit of the the end of our um, our our this week in space and astronomy history slash recognition section. We do have a little bit of an announcement. There are uh, public open tours at the observatory this week on Wednesday, March fifteenth, from six thirty p.m. So if you would like to come by the observatory and think you would feel like braving, braving the chances of the weather being clear, we will be doing a public tour from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, with daylight savings time, of course, if you arrive right at 6.30, the telescopes won't be open yet. So please consider the sun uh, sunset time. Um, daylight savings time is no astronomer's friend, especially not when it comes to timing your your tours and observing. So if you arrive before sunset, um, the telescope won't be quite open just yet, but you can still get a tour. Um, and that, yeah, so we're doing public tours ad hoc now at the observatory. Feel free to come by. Just get yourself an Eventbrite ticket on our website and click on whichever time slot that you would like to um, would like to show up for. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see we'll, we'll see what we can do for Andes about getting the uh, the weather fixed here for us. <laughs> um, all right, so let's uh, shift gears. Lots of stuff happening um, all over astronomy, but in terms of remembering what has come before, there's some really, really interesting history that I wanted to, to talk about particularly. Now that uh, Brent is here, <laughs> um, we're going to talk about one of my actually one of my favorite books. Uh, so Somnium is a very, very, very interesting book that I would recommend um, to, for absolutely everyone. So it was published in 1634. And it was written by Johannes Kepler. And you can today find copies of Somnium that are written with the original uh, Latin next to um, an English translation, which I highly recommend because if you've seen a little bit of English and French um, and Latin, you you kind of get to read it a little differently if you see the original next to um, next to the translation, but it is um, it's been called one of the the earliest works of science fiction. It has a really interesting combination of astronomy fact and 
fiction that I would say is very much in line with a lot of modern uh, science fiction um, uh, ideas, although it, I, I believe it did get Kepler and his mom into a little bit of trouble when it was published. <laughs> so uh, there's so much I could say about it in terms of its history and its um, uh, its its uh, its plot and it's interesting, but it's more than just science fiction. It's also science because you have to remember uh, Kepler himself is responsible for the first set of the laws of planetary motion, which were then used by, of course, Newton um, to formulate gravity for the stars. Um, and Kepler, in addition to being a very uh, gifted, detailed person, he was the first to correctly explain planetary motion in terms of their orbits by following the data. He became basically the founder of celestial mechanics as we know them um, now. And he was also quite a fan of, of natural laws in the modern sense, um, being something that is verifiable, universal, and precise. Um, so he, in addition to being an amazing astronomer, he um, published a few other books you might be interested in. So it's sort of like, if you, if you think you like science fiction, <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and give a little call out to some of our other, you know, sort of Kepler reading list. Astronomia Pars Optica, which is a, um, an optics uh, book, which was the first to investigate the formation of pictures with a pinhole camera. The first to, uh, that we know of, I should say, to explain the process of vision by refraction within the eye. Um, the first formulate eyeglass designs for nearsighted and farsightedness. And the first to explain the use of both eyes for depth perception. Um, and then, of course, he had his book, um, Diotris, which I'm probably pronouncing a little bit wrong. <laughs> um, that was a term coined by Kepler. And um, this is where he describes real, virtual, upright, and inverted images and magnification, which basically sets him up to describe how a telescope can work. And the first real description, again, that we know of for total internal reflection. All very, very valuable things. And if that's not enough, he also has um, again, you'll have to probably find a translation for this, um, the Stereometrica Doliorum, which forms a basis of integral calculus. And that one, I have to say, is not for the faint-hearted <laughs> because um, formulations of calculus are harder to use than calculus itself. But he does explain uh, the tides. Um, Galileo argued with him and reproved him for this. Kepler is not the first to, to correctly um, explain the, the tides. Actually, there are, um, there are records from early Australia of about um, on the order of 10 to 15,000 years before Kepler um, correctly explaining the tides with the moon. But I don't think he knew about those and he did come up with his own correct description for the tides. He tried to use stellar parallax. Um, he basically suggested that the sun rotates about its axis. Um, and he actually did a bit of uh, a bit of history himself, trying to use his knowledge um, to precisely um, drive what what year uh, Christ had been born in from his from his religion. And he not only that, he went ahead and did a derivation of logarithms based on mathematics. And you can thank him for the word satellite, which is in the um, a small publication of his, a pamphlet, which has a very long title. <laughs> um, so he, you can thank him for a lot of various different things. And I thought, you know, maybe to start off with a little bit of some of his other writings, you can imagine how you know, if you had this person who is really investigating the universe precisely and, um, you know, back in 1608, he's writing this first 
I suppose, uh, modern science fiction. Um, and it wasn't published until 1634 by, by, uh, by his son, I believe. But it's very, very interesting to kind of put it in, in context. <laughs> so I suppose I'll, I'll go ahead and um, uh, pass over to you, Perandis. Um, I think I've, I've told a little bit of some of what I thought were some of the interesting parts of the, the foundations of the book. Of course, you gave a great introduction uh, into the work, uh, work of Kepler. And I mean, um, Kepler himself is a fascinating character. And the fact that he wrote this book, um, it, it, is, it is even more fascinating. And how he, uh, this book actually got him into trouble later on, as you mentioned. So maybe we can discuss that. Uh, with regard to his mother uh, when she was accused of sorcery and witchcraft. Uh, but maybe we should just start by saying that Kepler was uh, one of the few people who were uh, converted into this creed of Copernicanism back then uh, with the idea of a heliocentric universe. Um, so just, just uh, to give some background um, to our audience tonight, and basically, uh, majority of the people, uh, the most accepted uh, structure for the universe was a geocentric universe, as was, uh, you know, uh, imagined by Plato and put into a physical form by Aristotle and later into a mathematical form by um, Ptolemy. A very interesting description of the universe, mathematically super complicated. And, um, you know, on top of that, uh, Muslim scholars uh, try to improve on the mathematics of this universe to make better predictions of the position of planets. And I mean, um, here comes um, this uh, Polish monk uh, by the name of uh, Nicholas Copernicus, who introduces a simpler system. Um, basically uh, with sun at the center. And uh, with this introduction, by making Earth a planet in orbit around the sun, the mathematics suddenly becomes a lot easier. And I mean, the book that he wrote, The Revolutionary Bus, was, um, I mean, a highly mathematical book. Very few people read it, in fact. But I mean, those who read it, uh, they they were mathematicians and they got convinced. And I mean, among these people was, of course, Kepler, uh, who believed that the true form of the universe, in fact, is a heliocentric universe rather than a geocentric universe. And uh, I mean, Kepler, again, just to give some background, was sort of hired as a human computer by the greatest uh, pre-telescopic um, era observ observer, um, Tycho Brahe, the famous Tycho Brahe, who had the best um, you know, observational data uh, at the time available. And he was hired there to basically fit orbits to his data. And I mean, um, well, on his deathbed, basically, Tycho asked Kepler to eventually solve, try to solve the problem of orbit of Mars, which was giving them so much trouble because no matter how hard they tried, the predictions that they were, they were making about the orbit of Mars did not come out right. Anyhow, so Kepler was uh, sort of, if you want, a protege of um, Tycho. And this book uh, sort of could be read as an autobiography of Kepler. So as you mentioned, Somnium was written in the year 1608, but it was not published until much later, simply because, um, I mean, because of the troubles that it caused uh, Kepler and later when it was published really because it was simply because his widow was in so much financial, uh, you know, uh, trouble that they needed the money. But he wrote the book in 1608, just pointing out um, to the fact that Galileo used his telescope to look at the skies uh, in December 1609 and January of 1610. So this was written a year before uh, Galileo's telescopic observations actually reveal that um, the Copernican model of the universe, in fact, is um, a better model, at least. Um, and yeah, well, as, as he says, it fits the data, right? Exactly. Um, and that I mean, was just so exciting. Yeah, they were using the circles and they were in trouble. And I mean, the bold move that Kepler made was to move from, uh, you know, circles 
the perfect shape of circles as it was uh, you know imagined by Plato and followed by Aristotle uh, it was a bold move that he made to ellipses right so what Kepler was doing in this book before even Galileo looked at the skies was trying to show that uh, the universe would look the same no matter whether you're standing on earth or on the moon so he's trying to give his readers a view as to how the universe would look if you go and stand on the moon. And what he's trying to do is just uh, to convince you of the truth of the Copernican uh, model of the universe. So uh, maybe I should give uh, like a summary of the story. Yeah, I think we should probably tell people what the story is, but I'll just say um, before we get into the actual story itself, one of the other things that is just so interesting about Kepler as a figure in science is he was doing this in a very different time than we are now, but he he found that he could not make the data agree with an Earth-centric universe. And instead of forcing it, instead of um, trying to find a workaround, instead of keeping his beliefs no matter what, he accepted the uncomfortable truth of the data and found something that fit what he really saw, even though it didn't, he didn't want that to be what he saw. And so in a way, um, and I think, you know, even Carl Sagan has, has said this, you know, it, he sort of, uh, provided an example to scientists everywhere that when you go out to make an, a discovery, it might just be a case of, you know, trying to see past your own preferences to what is really there. And that's such an appealing, uh, wonderful idea, I think. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and tell people about the story. But before we move in, I realize we're actually already at uh, 27 minutes for this episode. So this is probably a good time uh, for me to remind everybody uh, that you are in fact listening <laughs> to York Universe. We're broadcasting live from the Allen I. Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to join in with a live OPV online public viewing with our observatory crew over on YouTube, you can go through our website, yorku.ca slash science slash observatory, or you can go straight to YouTube and search for the Ellen I. Carswell Observatory at York University, and our channel will pop up. You'll see the live stream, and you can join in the chat right away. I'll tell them what you think about the heliocentric solar system or the geocentric one and um, you know join in. So tonight you're listening to uh, Dr. Perandis Tashbach and myself uh, Elena Hyde and um, thank you for for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started with uh, a little bit about the story itself. So <laughs> we've been talking a lot. The background matters so much on this though. Um, so, so go ahead Perandis. I'll let, I'll let you start off here. Of course, sure. So the title of the book is Somnium, right? The dream. And it's really about a dream. Um, I mean, um, Kepler talks about the fact uh, like the whole story is about a dream that he's having. And it's the story of a boy, a young boy uh, by the name of uh, Gerakotus um, from a country call, uh, that he calls Islandia. And it could be identified with Iceland. And this boy, Gerakotus, he lives with his mother, uh, Fyle Zilda, <laughs> and uh, she's described as a wise woman in the book who provides uh, the means of the sustenance uh, for her and her son, for herself and her son, by gathering herbs, cooking them, and uh, actually while she's cooking them, she performs various religious rites on them, right? So she's being uh, introduced in this whole story as a sorcerer. And she sells these, she basically stuffs um, these uh, cooked herbs inside small sacks and she, uh, she sells them to captains of the ships to keep them calm uh, during their voyages. 
So she is really introduced, uh, Doracotus's mother, mother, as a sorcerer. And um, the whole adventure starts when Doracotus, as a young boy, accidentally opens uh, one of these sacks uh, that his uh, mother sells. Um, and basically, uh, if you want, um, deprives the sack of the magical powers that it has. So the mother sells the sack uh, to a skipper and the skipper comes back telling uh, her that, uh, well, uh, there, is no, there are no herbs in here. So what is going on? So in order to keep the money uh, in a fit of rage, the mother offers to sell Doracotus and keep the money. So the skipper accepts and Doracotus basically <clears throat> Um, starts on this voyage, um, uh, which is bound uh, to Norway, and the ship that he embarks on with the skipper, of course, uh, is to stop at Denmark to deliver a letter uh, to the um, Icelandic uh, bishop, um, basically from Icelandic bishop to, sorry, Tycho Brahe. So just, just reminding everyone that Tycho Brahe uh, was a Danish um, astronomer. So they are supposed to take this letter from uh, the Bishop of Iceland uh, or Islandia to Tycho Brahe. When they arrive, uh, Doracotus is super, super sick. He's seasick. And the skipper uh, tell, uh, asks Tycho to actually take care of Doracotus, who is a 14-year-old boy by then. Antigua accepts and uh, basically uh, he starts teaching Doracotus um, the most divine of sciences, as it is called. In fact, they are referring to astronomy. So five years passes. Doracotus is now 19 years old and he is quite homesick. So he decides to go back and look for his mother, despite all that had happened during this time. And when he goes back to his own uh, fatherland, he, he is very happy to actually find his mother. So he tells his mother about uh, all his adventures and the fact that he now knows um, astronomy and he's uh, well familiar with uh, making observations um, and so on and so forth. This is when his mother tells him that, okay, so you have this knowledge and you have attained this knowledge in a certain way. You have been taught this knowledge. But of course, this knowledge is also available to um, certain people, including her, uh, through the teachings of what she, call, she calls the wise spirits. So, and by wise spirits, she's really uh, referring to demons. Now, as you're sitting there and discussing astronomy, uh, the mother decides to summon one of these demons, the so-called demon of Livonia, uh, that is a land which is located 50,000 German miles high up in the air. So demon of Livonia, really uh, Livonia is referring to uh, the moon. Okay, so the demon comes in and uh, after an initial shock that Doracotus has, uh, uh, the demon starts talking about the fact that, yes, they um, frequently uh, take people back and forth between the earth and the moon. So he talks about the dangers of such a journey and, uh, in fact, um, how people should be protected, especially their limbs should be protected, because if they are not protected enough, they might be torn apart because of the acceleration that they are subjected to. In addition to that, he talks about the fact that there is no moisture in his space. And so when he's basically transporting uh, people from Earth to the moon, uh, he covers uh, their noses and mouths with damp sponges. Furthermore, they are put into sleep with narcotics. Otherwise, they won't be able to actually uh, make uh, the journey. Third, uh, what is interesting here is that um, Kepler is very well aware of the conditions of space. And that's fascinating because he knows that uh, we are protected by the atmosphere of the earth from the rays of sun. And uh, he mentions that because there is no atmosphere to protect us, 
This journey would only be possible during a full lunar eclipse. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're going to be burned and you're going to be uh, severely hurt by the, um, you know, uh, rays of sun. So uh, basically, the journey only happens during a lunar eclipse and the journey roughly takes about four hours between the Earth and the Moon. And then um, the demon of Lavania starts talking about uh, what kind of place Lavania is, what kind of place the Moon is. And he talks about the fact that the moon is actually divided into two hemispheres, subvolva and pi volva, uh, through a divisor that passes through the poles of the sphere. So the inhabitants of subvolva always observe their volva. And by volva, he is really referring to a satellite, the satellite being the Earth. So what he's trying to get to here is the synchronous rotation of the moon. So you know how the moon, uh, moon's orbital period is equal to its rotational period. And as a result, we are always seeing one side of the moon. So he's saying that the people of Subvolva are the people who are facing the Earth and they constantly see the Earth. But the dark side of the moon, the other, well, really not dark side of the moon, I should say far <laughs> side of the moon. Yes. <laughs> which we cannot see, it is never, it's always uh, illuminated, which we cannot see uh, are the people uh, of Privolva who are deprived of this view of the Earth. So uh, basically, uh, I, I have a couple of quotes actually from the book. If you think that would be interesting for people, uh, yeah, I think I think a few a few quotes would probably be good because um, the, some of the uh, descriptions are are very very good, and I I particularly like how they managed to well how Kepler managed to um, sort of merge the uh, the fiction and the fact. Exactly. <laughs> In fact, the appendix of the book, which is concerned with the facts that he's trying to demonstrate through this whole story, is longer than the story itself. There is so much written there. And I mean, I, let, let me just read you this about the privalvans, people who do not see the vulva, they do not see the moon uh, being the earth, right? So he says the privalvans uh, night lasts 15 or 16 of our days, terrible with never ending shadows, as are our own moonless nights. The rays of the vulva never light upon them. For this reason, everything becomes stiff from the ice, the frost, and from the savages and most powerful winds. One day ensues 14 of our days long, or a little less than that, it becomes intolerably hot. Thus, for the space of one of our months or of one Levanian day, he's really referring to the fact that a day on the moon, a whole system of 20, um, you know, uh, well, for the lack of the word, um, well, English lacks this word, right? Uh, day, I mean, a whole cycle of day and night. He's just referring to the fact that uh, a system, a cycle of day and night on the moon is equal to one month, right? Because he's just referring to the synchronous rotation. So he's saying that 15 days is uh, night and 15 days is day. So he says that thus for the space of one of our months or of one Levanian day and in one and the same place, the heat becomes 15 times hotter than our Africa and the cold unbearable. So he is really trying to talk about how things look from the surface of the moon because of the synchronous rotation. Yeah, and he's quite right as well. Um, I mean, not not precisely right, but without, um, you know, without much of an atmosphere, the extremes in temperature from when you are getting sun to when you are not getting sun is uh, much higher than we would experience here, you know, underneath our atmosphere that protects us. Exactly. Um, and that's right. What is interesting for me is that Galileo was uh, aware of the fact that the sun, uh, the moon does not have an atmosphere. And he argues, um, in fact, that the moon goes through extreme changes of temperature because of lack of atmosphere. But what is interesting for me is that in this story, Kepler assumes that the moon has an atmosphere. Um, and then, um, I mean, uh, perhaps the most interesting part of the book is when he talks about 
uh, the beings that live on uh, on the surface of the moon. So it is not a barren land as we know it. It is a place that uh, has its own uh, native, uh, you know, creatures that are sort of adapted to that environment. And of that, again, this is another interesting quote for me. He writes, their nature is generally, generally like the snakes. They have a strange love for basking in the noonday sun, but close to their caves so that they can make a swift and safe retreat. Others uh, whose spirits have been exhausted by the heat of the day lose their life, but return through the night on account of some paradoxical cause like the production of flies here on earth. Here and there, all over the ground, are scattered masses in the shape of pine cones. Their rinds are sunburned through the day and die, but in the evening produce living creatures when the hiding places are opened. So again, he's talking about the fact that these creatures are in fact adapted to the extreme changes of temperature on the surface of the moon. Um, let me see what else I, um, there is some well, on those, those creatures as well. That's something that we do see here on earth. So there's some, you know, um, knowledge he could have had of, for example, in, in desert or extremely dry climates where seeds are stored, uh, when there is rain. Um, so, you know, you get a desert, uh, desert in bloom sort of phenomenon. Um, and I've seen this, you know, it's very noticeable in places, um, like some of the deserts in Australia, uh, you have a completely dead barren landscape add a little bit of water and then you get a bloom of activity and then it goes back into hibernation and we've also seen it in cold places um and so this kind of natural explanation um for a um an a fictional character <laughs> right that's something that we expect more now with modern science we ask well what's the biology of that alien <laughs> right Exactly. How, how would it work? And he's actually that in the story. Exactly. And that's fascinating. I mean, uh, the fact that he's trying to come up with creatures that are adapted to the extreme changes of temperature, I mean, that's that's quite novel. That's something that perhaps Kepler pioneered. I, I, I mentioned that. Uh, this fictional voyage, um, if you want, or description of the, surface of the moon, is not the first uh, science fiction about the moon. Actually, there is another one called A True Story or A True History by Lucian, uh, which was written in the second century AD. And there, basically, Lucian talks about uh, traveling to the moon. And I mean, that, that's another story for another time. But I mean, his account is really uh, more satirical about a society that lacks women and I mean uh, the, the people have very different physiology but it just doesn't make sense what he's saying it's more satirical but with Kepler uh, I mean I think he has been very creative in terms of coming up with creatures that are adapted to the possible environment that he's imagining Moon could have Yes, exactly. And I mean, as you say, he's not the first, certainly not the first person to come up with the idea of creatures of some sort on the moon. Um, you know, through myth and legend, there have been throughout humanity um, ideas, but he was the first to do it this way. And um, you even have things like um, the uh, the face of the moon from uh, Plutarch, which was back in 1595, I think, um, that was uh, sort of a review of um, of the moon that that Kepler would have had access to, and that that would have sort of um, exposed him to a little bit of um, you know sort of. Uh, uh, Greek scientific thought on the moon at the time. That's and so true. some of this, you know, you can see he's he's pulled various things together to make the story, but a lot of it is, as I would say, it's that what we would call now a modern scientific approach asking how would it work? He even uses a Lagrange point in his, um, 
in his uh in his voyage to the moon <laughs> right so <laughs> he, he is being as accurate as possible but also taking fictional license of course adding yes. an atmosphere and exactly it is just fascinating i mean uh the stuff that he writes and i mean sometimes people dismiss um you know the past and say oh well uh great uh, i mean huge leaps in our understanding has happened in the 20th century or 21st century but when i personally at least read this stuff uh, i feel like oh my gosh uh they they were really men ahead of their times they knew a lot and they could put it into good use but I mean, yeah, he knew a lot. Uh, he was a great mathematician. He was uh, really a scientist in the sense that we call someone a scientist today without any prejudice, as you mentioned, uh, with regard to what is uh, what he wants to be true and what the actual truth is. And I mean, anyone who has uh, done scientific work, uh, and I'm sure, um, uh, Elena, you're familiar with that feeling. You are expecting something and you end up with something that is completely different. And that mm. feeling inside you that hurts a lot. <laughs> well, and it's, it's, I, oh my, oh no, I've done it wrong, but maybe you haven't. And that's, it's the learning, learning to trust your data or learning to, to put the errors in your data as precisely as possible so that you know what's really there and what's not exactly. and that's that's i mean it's incredibly simple but it's actually very hard for humans to do <laughs> like, i is, say this as i say this as a human <laughs> yeah it is hard and that's what i mean and i mean kepler centuries ago he overcame his own prejudice and, and the prejudice of 1500 years before, yes. you know, something that had built up into being the uh, most perfect heavens and actually abandoning that. And that takes a lot of courage. And yeah, well, and, and listening to what you can see and not what everyone else around you is saying, exactly. that's something that I'm like, well, this is 2023 and this was written in 1610. I feel like it's very relevant. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's actually before it gets too far along I, I do want to say for this particular story he did write it for scientists and um, it wasn't as I say published uh, for a little bit after he um, uh, after he wrote it but his manuscript um, in 1610 was not meant to go to certain audience <laughs> Because, exactly. because he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't actually, he was aware that there was a, a high um, uh, sort of barrier to this kind of thought. It was meant for other scientists to read, uh, but it got away from him. And that's where, of course, as you mentioned before, um, the similarities between uh, Kepler um, and, of course, um, Duracidus, and his mother and the uh, wise woman or uh, witch, as we might say uh, in modern terms, exactly. um, in League with Spirits, it did get uh, it did get him into well, and his mom into quite a lot of trouble because it did get out that he had written this, and they did arrest his um, mother, uh, Catherine Kepler, in 1615 on suspicion of practicing witchcraft and that was a pretty terrifying thing to be arrested for because you could be killed in some very bad ways <laughs> um, <laughs> it was really really terrifying i'm sure for for it's himself for his mother for his family um and they did actually get uh, caught up in the um in the 17th century european witch craze uh, and it took quite a lot for her not to be treated as um, many, many, many other women were um, horrifically, horrifically murdered uh, by basically being charged as 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 witches. Um, and it's worth remembering this was an absolute awful, um, you know, 
death sentence at the time. Uh, being a being a quarrelsome woman or a cantankerous having a cantankerous dis, dis, um, disposition was was a death sentence. Um, and that's that's uh, you know this is also part of that same history and part of the same story. Exactly, and I mean. Uh, basically, uh, his mother is known to have been quite capricious and, uh, you know, they say, uh, ungovernable temper. Mm. Exactly. I mean, she sounds, she sounds awesome though, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she got into fights with different women in their village and the even the one of the first, uh, reporting that she's a witch and then this killer, uh, in the same year that our Leo, his name is a uh, letter to Bernardus Christine, Kepler uh, in Germany is uh, studying law to actually uh, save his mother. And then this manuscript comes in. Uh, which is, in fact, the evidence of her own son. Um, in one of the sentences of this manuscript, uh, there is uh, actually um, the demon of Lavania says, uh, or uh, I think the mother says that not everyone can make the trip. Uh, these demons, they prefer very old women. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> in the sky and i mean they read this and they're like okay so this guy directus is an assistant to tico and he's working as an astronomer so that's you and you are saying your own mother <laughs> is a witch and a sorcerer so he was really devastated apparently when this manuscript came out because it was used against his mother thankfully he managed to defend her and <laughs> get her released but i mean i i can only imagine what he went yeah through. well and it, it took apparently um you know five years of his mother being in in prison which was pretty bad um uh for him to get her free and so that would have been 1620 and she died only two years later um basically from from being imprisoned under this very very strong um strongly bad circumstance so you know right. he did eventually get her released but she she still passed away from the five years of, of abuse in prison um and it's it's like you know that's that's really really tough and that would have been a five year long legal battle draining his finances and um really really tough <laughs> so yeah. Uh, very, very, very hard um, ordeal for both both her, him and her, and um, you know made it very difficult for him to recover afterwards. Of course. Exactly. Exactly. So it was. Um, I mean, it's a book with a lot of story. Like it's a fiction with a lot of story behind it. Uh, and um, I mean, maybe uh, uh, it was a good lesson for Kepler. <laughs> to be careful about what he said um, but I mean he is really he he's really uh, a role model for being patient for perseverance for you know um, really a true scientist uh, in every aspect when you look at it yeah and it's really I mean um, I would say probably one of my top 10 books of all time like if you're going to read something if you're only going to read 10 books let this be one of them but definitely read more than 10 books <laughs> um, yeah. i just wonder why no one makes a movie out of this yeah and it's it's well and it, it it's so complicated and intricate and um it's meaningful in so many different ways because of course Kepler himself as a human is interesting the astronomy is interesting the history is interesting the math is incredibly complex and amazingly interesting um so i just feel like you would have a real trouble uh doing justice to it <laughs> um and if you read the story by itself, uh, try to read a little bit about some of the uh, some of the history around it as well, because, of course, you know, as you say, this is happening in a astonishing time. We had, um, you know, in 1610 as well, uh, the Galileo's sorry messenger. We had, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And then, you know, the. Um, uh, 
uh, the somewhat craze of um, literal witch hunts happening in Europe, which made things extremely bloody <laughs> and nerve-wracking uh, for many people. That's so the uh, astronomy is always done um, by humans, and in this case, it was it really it really is an astonishing story in more ways than one. It is. It is one of the best, um, I mean, voyages to the moon. Uh, there came another one, The Man in the Moon, in 1638 by uh, Francis Godwin, uh, who was a bishop in the uh, Church of England. But I mean, that, that's, a story. that's a good story, but none of these stories are as accurate as Kepler's story and the science that he depicts through his science fiction, in fact. Yeah, and it's 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 worth noting as well is that um, you know a lot of these same aspects will be picked up and and used in other other places. Um, and the, some of the first uh, um, from the first movies had little bits of uh, you know um, uh, science fiction in them, and of course it'll go on to expi inspire from Earth to the Moon, which also has a a shooting out of people to the moon, but with like a literal cannon or gun, basically yeah, shooting think, space bullets. Most transportation is uh, supernatural, but the way he describes that this should happen during a lunar eclipse. And he talks about the fact that, okay, at most uh, it's four hours that you have before basically uh, you could uh, finish this voyage because that's like the maximum amount of time that you'll get during a lunar eclipse to be protected by the shadow of the earth. That's another interesting thing. The fact that he talks about the phases of the earth as uh, someone would see if they were standing on the surface of the moon, just like we see phases of the moon, what would you see? How would the Earth appear if you go and stand on the surface of the moon? What kind of phases it would show? Like, it's just fascinating what he could see. Yeah, and of course, this was all without a um, a real uh, proper, as we would call it, physics formulation of the um, the Newtonian laws of gravity, because that exactly. did not that did not exist yet. No. Um, and so he's he's as you say, very accurate, very accurate for what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, even by standards today, it is still accurate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, and it uses the facts in a scientific, in a scientific way. Um, you know, there's multiple defenses of um, sort of diurnal rotation. There's, um, you know, the perspective change when you move away from the Earth, getting to see planets in a different, um, you know, in a different uh, orientation and, of course, um, different size, which wouldn't wouldn't actually be that much different. But <laughs> exactly. it's the right idea, which is which is where we're where we're going with this. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, highly recommended. Uh, book highly recommended. <laughs> Absolutely, and it looks like we've got about two minutes left. Um, shall I shall I tell about the uh, one more moon moon interesting thing to end us off? Please. <laughs> um, so from from Somnium and Kepler and the history of astronomy, all the way through the modern age, the quote unquote dark side of the moon has been one of the things that has always been uh, mysterious to humans because we didn't get to see it until the first satellite went behind. And it's not because it's dark, it's just because it's on the far side of Earth and we have synchronous rotation. So one side of the moon always faces us. And Kepler had this right. He actually said, you know, there would be light. Um, you would get, you know, sunlight on both sides as, as you do. Uh, but uh, the, far side of the moon is actually an awesome location if you don't want to look at earth <laughs> so if you want a telescope that's not looking at earth um, putting it on the far side of the moon is a really good bet and so i'll just end off today with a little bit of a shout out to the lu c at l u s e e lunar surface electromagnetics experiment um, that is set to be launched in just a few years as a telescope a radio telescope on the moon's far side 
Um, so I'll go ahead and end off with that there and say um, I hope that you all are inspired uh, to go out and look at the moon. And everyone, you have been look listening to your, your universe, sorry, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Dr. Perendis Tashbach and myself, Elena Hyde. Stay tuned because it is Astronomy Night in Canada and you can always find us on our website at, at um, sorry, not observatory. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any questions, comments, or send us an email at observe at yorku.ca. Thanks for tuning in to York Universe. Clear skies and have a good night. Bye-bye.